Um, I'm going to hand you over to someone who's uh, an absolute authority on marketing leadership. Mark de Swan Ahrens is co-founder and chairman of Effective Brands. Um, he's an acknowledged thought leader on global marketing leadership and also co-author of the best-selling marketing book, The Global Brand CEO, How to Build the Ultimate Marketing Machine. <coughs> Mark co-founded Effective Brands in 2001 following a successful career in Unilever working in the Netherlands and New York, and is also a fellow Dutchman like myself. Um, at Effective Brands, Mark spearheads the leading, leading global brand study, which is an ongoing learning pro uh, project with contributions from over 300 global brands and 3,000 global brand leaders. And in 2013, Mark is leading the, the Marketing 2020 study focused on aligning marketing strategy, structure, and capability to drive business growth. So it's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce Mark de swan -Aarons. Morning. Hey, Bart. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, when you get given the first presentation, uh, no pressure, and it's all about the future, and then you introduce it with lots of slides that other people have said about the future and, and how every one of them was clearly wrong. So I'm set up for success here. Thanks, Bart. <laughs> um, good morning. I'm Mark. I am indeed uh, one of the founders of a company called Effective Brands, but that's enough about us. I'm uh, based out of New York. Uh, thank you for inviting me, David, to this uh, wonderful meeting. My body clock, I'm not quite sure where it is, but it's certainly not awake yet. Uh, when I woke up this morning at, uh, at 5, God knows why, I, uh, the first meeting I had was with my wife, who, um, who, who sort of gave me the download as, a, as being a father. And um, my youngest is 5 years old, and uh, she said that we've got to talk because she was sent home because she'd hit somebody at school. And my daughter is very expressive. She, she's like an Italian, but uh, as far as I know, there's no Italian in her. <laughs> it's actually getting me to think now. <laughs> and so she talks like this. Uh, but when she gets angry, she, she pushes and such. And so what had happened was a boy in her class had pushed her aside, and she got up and smacked him right in the face. <laughs> so mixed reactions here, because I'm kind of proud <laughs> on the one hand. But this is where the problem comes. My wife, this was at the playground when they were being picked up. She took her aside, and everybody's looking. And uh, she said to my daughter, what, what are you doing? And she looked, my uh, she looked her mother straight in the face and said, look, mommy, I know I'm supposed to use my words, but I've got a lolly in my mouth. <laughs> and when you start reasoning at that level, you, you know, you're negotiating at, um, in planes that are very, very difficult. Um, all this just to say that when you travel a lot, as I do, uh, you have to tackle these challenges at very weird times of the day. We were trying to figure this one out this morning at 5. So, okay, uh, Marketing 2020. You've heard a few things about it. I'm, um, I'm very happy to be here. And um, this is a very large study, as you will uh, get to learn. And I'm doing it an enormous disservice by trying to sort of share a lot of information in a short period of time. And it's not, it, yes, it's underpinned by research, but it's a project, it's actually a platform we created to, to get the sort of best marketing minds in the world to think about how we do this together. Because no one will argue that there's an awful lot changing. And, and, and sort of the disclaimer is that um, I share this in the spirit of humbleness, not that we're predicting the future, but more that we see some mega trends, which we as marketers, I think, all face and need to step back and say, how do we address these on behalf of our brands? How do we res respond to them on behalf of our organizations? And, and if it starts a dialogue, if it gets you with one thought that you take home uh, tomorrow or the day after, into, back into your brand teams, into your businesses, and, uh, and, it, and it gets you to look at it slightly differently, then, then I will have done my job. Um, because I don't think anybody, I, I hate it when somebody gets up on the stage and says, marketing's changing. Because I don't think it is, actually. I think the fundamentals that we as marketers in the room signed on for, that we chose a career in of, 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 of linking or discovering insights and then turning those into propositions that you know, discriminate versus our competition, drive added value. That's the game of marketing. And that hasn't changed. Our profession in its core, I think, is very much the same. But the environment within which we are doing that, I don't think anybody would argue, has changed pretty much beyond recognition over just especially the sort of last decade. And uh, I, I want to just sort of share some data points or some observations of, of some of those changes 
and, uh, and, and hopefully bring you on board in, in terms of that that's, that's our reality today. I mean, take for example, Apple launching their new series of phones at uh, 6.27 p.m. I know why, because exactly an hour later, their main competitor, Nokia, is, is not only responding at a global level to this big competitive threat, but doing it with wit and coordination. And you have to ask yourself, how many organizations in the world are able to have that kind of turnaround time to a main competitive action an hour later? Big change, speed. And then this, transparency, global transparency. If your brand does anything anywhere, this may happen. Let's look at the, the CEO of Barilla for a second. Yesterday, I apologize for offending many people around the world. Today, I'm repeating that apology. Through the entire life, I've always respected every person I've met, including gays and their families, without any distinction. I've never discriminated against anyone. I've heard the countless reaction around the world to my words, which have impressed and saddened me. It is clear that I have a lot to learn about the lively debate concerning the evolution of the family. In the coming weeks, I pledge to meet a representative of the groups that best represent the evolution of the family, including those who have been offended by my words. So this is the CEO of Barilla, a pastor company in Italy. He gave an interview to a local newspaper and somewhere along the conversation they discussed uh, gays and whether gays featured in their advertising worldwide and he made a comment that he thought it would be inappropriate. The next day, undoubtedly after a 24 hour uh, deep dive on PR and crisis management, he was globally, and this has been seen millions of times now, defending the company. And in the US, full page ads by the main competitors advertising the different colors of pasta and we're for everyone. And, uh, you know, this, this, this happens everywhere, and you're a brand that's also very, very closely watched anywhere, anywhere in the world. Um, you know, the speed with which these things get translated outside the company are so often much, much faster than they are internally. But it's not all bad. I mean, look at this as an example, McDonald's, of, of, of creating transparency because they're actually proud of what they stand for. This is McDonald's Canada. I often find that uh, Canada pushes the envelope. Certainly, I'm, I'm based in America, and uh, uh, the, the Americans are much more conservative. The Canadians tend to do the things a little faster and a little bit more edgy. And, uh, and I don't think this could have happened in uh, America yet. But here, they took the 10 most asked questions on Facebook, and they said, you know what, let's just answer them. Let's make a little video. It's a two and a half minute video. I cut it down to a minute to address that question that we all must have had at one point, which is why when I open the box, does my quarter pounder look so much different to the picture up there? Hi, I'm Hope Bagazi, Director of Marketing for McDonald's Canada. And I'm here with a question from Isabel M. from Toronto, Ontario. She asks, why does your food look different in the advertising than what's in the store? It's a great question, Isabel. We get asked that a lot. And if you want to come with me, I'm going to take you across the street. We're going to find out a bit more. Come on. I think it's important to note that all the ingredients that Noah uses are the exact same ingredients that we use in the restaurant. So it's the exact same patties, it's the exact same ketchup and mustard and onions and the exact same buns. Here you can definitely see that there's a size difference. The box that our sandwiches come in, keep the sandwiches warm, which creates a bit of a steam effect and it does make the bun contract a little bit. And then the main difference is the fact that we actually took all the ingredients that are normally hidden under the bun and we pulled them to the foreground so that you can see them. And those are the main differences. So, Isabel, thank you so much for your question. We hope that's answered it for you. Thanks. Now, when you watch that video, you can't but respect what they're doing. These people stand for their products. They are the real ingredients. And if I was taking a picture of something and actually half the stuff was hidden under the bun, yeah, it does kind of make sense that you show it, otherwise you won't know about it. You look at these videos and you walk away with an impression of this is a company that's willing to engage, willing to show what they stand for, willing to show what they do, and it's all real. Now, again, a level of transparency that I think very few organizations in the world can say that they actually live up to. And of course, once we get used to these things in one place in our lives and of one company we deal with, consumers quickly start to transplant those expectations of the other businesses they do business with. 
So, so, so why? Why do we need to do this? Well, I mean, the, the, we, we've coined sort of Generation Y as a WHY because the new consumers want to know. You'll hear Keith Reed uh, talk uh, this afternoon a lot about uh, the pressures that Unilever feels itself under. But if it isn't the consumers, and in many markets, young consumers, millennials, are indeed shaping the, 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 the brunt of the spending power that's coming into the category, if it's not them, it's your employees. Andy Fennell, the CEO or CMO rather of, uh, of Diageo, he, um, when we interviewed him, he said, you know, when I, when I interviewed with Diageo, I asked him what kind of car I was going to get. He said, these days, the interviews I'm fielding to win the talent that we need in marketing, to win the talent across all the disciplines, people are asking us, what do we stand for as a company? And this is something that people are asking individually, but also organizations like Oxfam here in the UK are making it incredibly easy to understand what the company does behind the scenes, what the work and the ethics behind the products that you're buying are. Are there equal rights and equal pay for women? How are gay partners treated in medical care and so forth? Whatever you find important, this is not some fad. The transparency is just exploding. So I don't think anybody would argue that the, the things we have to deal with in our marketing mix today is changing very quickly. But the interesting thing is that actually the organization that we're part of, the way marketing is structured, has hardly changed. If you look at the organigrams of marketing organizations of many of the companies I know, they look very much like the 1950s brand management systems that were created and founded by, uh, whether it's Procter & Gamble or Unilever, you can argue that. So that's an interesting dilemma. It's a real contrast. And that was the feeding ground and the, uh, if you like, the kernel of inspiration for Marketing 2020. I stand here representing Effective Brands because we led it, but it was actually a, a very significant consortium of global players that said, we should look at this. We need to understand where this is going. And we did that first in the US, but very quickly, 10 other markets, including the UK, with ISBA being the partner here and Marketing Week, the publication, uh, this rolled out to become much bigger than we had expected. And instead of one, this was a market conducted over 10 markets in the world. Uh, we built an um, advisory board to keep us focused. And it's particularly interesting that Keith will be here this afternoon to, uh, to give his uh, take on that because he was the chairman of that advisory board. But we tried to get financial and service uh, in there. And we really went broad. We talked across these 10 markets with over 250 chief marketing officers, but also agency thought leaders and people that are doing slightly different things that completely lead in the same market. Like, for example, Obama's digital head, credited by many, including Obama himself, with having won the election. What does it take to do marketing in this new world? And then we went quant, and actually over 10,000 marketers, not consumers, marketers, from 92 markets participated. So when I show you data along the way, what I'm hoping to strike the balance between is vision or, if you like, inspiration for thought on the one hand, underpinned with very, very hard data on performance on the other. Because you could say everybody's view is interesting, but actually I'm most interested in the views of the people that are leading organizations that are growing faster than their competition. And that's what we looked at. The topics we asked about was if this is all changing, and if companies are opening up and touching across so many touch points, their consumers, what is the role of marketing within that framework? And once we know the role, who does what? Between global and local, but also what do we ask our agencies to do? And these new partners, like Facebook is here today, about 50% of companies have a direct relationship with Facebook and Twitter, not through their agency. And then what about consumers? Where do we allow people to play? How do we facilitate or manage or lead those roles, and once we know who does what, how do we equip ourselves and our colleagues, our teams, all of you are leaders, how do we equip in such a pace change organization, how do we equip our teams for success? And finally, at a much more personal level, how do you lead it? Because I don't think anybody here would be willing to stand up, well, I could challenge you, but I don't think you would, to say, look, I am myself adequately informed and equipped to lead my marketing organization into this change. Because it's happening so fast, what we see is that indeed one of the big challenges is how do you do that as a leader? So those were our areas, all in service of business growth. So 
the way I wanted to tackle that is to first just take a step back and say, what are the key opportunities and challenges that marketers play back to us as motivators and inspiration, but also challenges, and then look at what it takes to win in terms of characteristics of winning brands, but also characteristics of the organizations of those winning brands, winning organizations, in other words. But first, a quick step back. What did people play back in the quant and across the call as the big motivators? Well, unsurprising, social and actually collaborating with consumers around developing new solutions, those were the number one and two. This is a time when you can, it's never been possible to learn as much about a consumer's wishes as ever before. So if you're in marketing, that must be inspiring. And then figuring out together what it is that you need versus you versus you, that's marketing in its essence. So number one and number two, unsurprisingly. Number three, more surprisingly to me, giving meaning to the organization. Purpose. I know that David has started an enormous initiative within Barclays. It's right on the money, as you'll hear. But this is something where marketers are playing back. Do you know what? We're helping the company find its footing again in a time of madness. And this is not made for you. Eh? These are findings across all industries. But I think it's probably particularly relevant for your sector. In a time when trust has been lost, where companies have lost their way, Marketing is actually feeling that it's helping the organization find its footing again in terms of what is it we're trying to do? Why do we even exist? Meaning for not just marketing, but for the whole company. And then the fourth big motivator was globalization. I don't think there is a marketer today that isn't either working on the global brand or competing a global brand. And that's very different to just a decade ago. But if I had to identify one overriding motivator for marketers, it is that actually we're being listened to more than ever before. Sort of the, the, the curve I see is that 10 years ago, and I know I'm grossly uh, simplifying this, but 10 years ago, marketers were seen by their peers in the board and therefore their colleagues in other disciplines as the spenders that had very, very little idea about effectiveness. In fact, we kind of were perceived to be living in our own little world with our own goobly gook KPIs around brand equity and little scores that we found interesting and you know, advertising scores. And then we came into the board and everybody was like, are they in the same business as we are? And what has clearly happened is that over the last decade, with collaboration between CFOs and CMOs, Marketer has earned its place as an equal in terms of we're building business. But it goes on beyond that, because now the other disciplines, and I'd be interested to hear if that's true for you as well, are coming to marketing and saying, you know this digital thing, you know this social thing, you guys seem to be at the leading edge within our company of that. And in HR, we need to understand this, because it's becoming really important for recruitment. Or in supply chain, we need to understand it, because it's becoming really important in finding new partners to work with. And so, Keith, again, was at CES last week. I met him in Vegas, and he was there with a team of marketers, but also supply chain people, because he was exemplifying how to find new partners on behalf of Unilever. And so marketers are feeling more listened to, and I've got the data to support this now, than ever before. And let's be honest, we all want to make a difference, so that's a gratifying feeling. High spirits around the opportunities in marketing, but it's not all rosy. Because when you say, okay, well, what's actually keeping you awake at night? What's worrying you? There's a few clear, mostly internal things that can play back. The first is too much information. People, we love our data, but you know what? Actually, it's, I've got enough, thank you. You know what? <laughs> now the data is coming in left, right, center, from the back and from above and below. And Mark is saying, I, I don't know how to deal with this. This is literally too much information. Haven't got the people haven't got the framework, haven't got the consistency of the data. It's a big issue. And then beyond that, looking at the organization, seeing what's working outside in terms of integrated solutions that are going towards experiences, I'll talk more about that, and then looking inside and seeing silos that don't collaborate. CMOs talking to us and saying, I'm formally responsible for e-commerce, for our website, for social and marketing, and I'm ashamed to admit that although they all report up to me, they all deal with our customers in a different way, different tone of voice, different proposition. I'm not able to get them to work together. It's a huge frustration of marketers. And just imagine if that's the case and they don't report up to you. 
because they see that that touch point consistency is so crucial and actually most organizations just don't deliver. Now another huge worry is privacy. I mean, just uh, as I was leaving New York two days ago, the news broke that Target, who at Christmas announced that they'd lost the data on 40 million credit card holders, actually it was 110 million. That's a third of America, more than a third of America, whose name, addresses, and credit card details they lost. I don't even understand how Target has those for a third of all people in America, but no CMO, despite all the advantages of going personalization, wants to be the one that has to announce that that's what they did and that's what they lost. It's a huge factor holding people back into moving into personalization and information gathering. And finally, this resource thing. Because somewhere the CFO and the CEO picked up that social media, that's free, isn't it? So you, you need less resources, I imagine, because that's where the marketing's going, right? Well, actually, no, because it's yet more touch points, and I've got to manage these, and I need more people, not less. But somehow the perception seems to be there that we don't need more money. And of course, as Barclays, you are impervious to that, right? There's no cost cutting in Barclays, I'm sure. But overriding, it's a sense among the leaders, and I'm speaking to you as marketing leaders, that there is an insecurity, a lack of confidence of, do you know what? I've made my way into this leadership role. I'm now asked to make the big decisions around spend priorities, and I actually don't think I know enough. You know, I've got young people in the organization that are inspiring and that say we should do this, this, and this. But they haven't got the strategy. I've got the strategy, but I'm not quite sure that I understand how to evaluate all those new technologies we could be using, all those new touch points we could be using. Should we be communicating with people through their phone or not? Should we be doing interactive billboards while people are waiting for their bus or not? How do you even evaluate those things? And leaders who are busy enough anyway, are finding that they don't know how to school themselves, if you like, to a level so that they're comfortable that they're taking the right strategic decisions. So it brings you to the question of what does it take to win? And for that, I really want to sort of just go one step back behind the methodology, because I mentioned that we looked at the winners versus the losers, or when I give this presentation in America, I have to politically correct say the overperformers and the underperformers, because there are no losers. Uh, and seriously, my first day um, at Unilever America, I got a memo about the product that I was going to work on, and it said sales were soft. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it's going really badly? No, no, soft. That's, this is America. But anyway, we, use, we say winners and losers everywhere else in the world. We actually looked at how do the companies that have outperformed in growth, revenue growth, over the last three years, how did they answer the questions differently to the people that underperformed. So when I show you data, it's gonna be overperformer against underperformer. And I wanna take you through this learning using a framework that we're calling the Marketing 2020 framework, which is all around what are the characteristics of the winning brands, and then how are the organizations wired? What's driving the way they work in terms of connecting through the disciplines and across the disciplines, inspiring everyone in the organization around not only the purpose, but the strategy, and then creating enormous focus around and what are the three things we need to do this year and what is your role and how do we build the capability? How do we make sure that we learn as we iterate? That's the framework and I'm gonna focus first now on what we call the characteristics of winning marketing 2020 brands. Now we ask people, describe the big trends that are driving your strategy. And perhaps it was a bad market research question because we basically got back the same trends from everybody. It wasn't a differentiator. Now, perhaps that's because we all read the same marketing magazines and we go to the same conferences as marketers, but there was literally but one no difference between winners and losers. The first point that we identified as being a differentiator is big insights. Not big data, but big insights. Now, what do I mean by that? Big data is the thing that seems to be thrown around left right and central at the moment in every marketing publication. But to me, big data is a little bit like sex at high school. Everybody talks about it, but nobody's done it. <laughs> or if they do it, they do it terribly badly. <laughs> now, everybody says they have data. Everybody has data. They've got too much of it, you saw that. The differentiator, and that's the questions you see here, look particularly to the one on the right. We are able to leverage the data 
to improve our marketing effectiveness. It's when you look your colleague marketer in the eye and you say, look, you've got all this data, how is it influencing you on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, perhaps in some industries on a daily basis, in the way you go to market? And is that connection fluid? That seems to be a big characteristic of difference between the people that are overperforming in revenue growth and those that are underperforming. Are they able to use the data? As marketers, do they believe it's operationalized? Big issue and big opportunity. That's the first. The second is a topic close to David's heart and I imagine to all of your hearts, which is purpose. Now we ask people, is societal purpose, we thought we'd really formulate the question sharp, is that gonna drive competitive advantage? Just to test, and by the way, in Europe I was expecting higher scores, in America I was expecting far more cynical lower scores around the value of purpose to differentiate yourself versus competition. But it actually turned out that everyone agrees that purpose is important. And so we had to dig deeper to say, well, what do we mean by this? And if I'm not mistaken, Jim Stengel was here last year. He is very closely involved in this study and our book as well. And then he wrote his own book just about purpose. And um, we've we sort of sparred with him on well, what do people actually mean with this and what does it look like for brands? And you're gonna see some of these brands presented today and stories behind those brands um, analyzed today. But what we see is that purpose is the overriding umbrella for everything the brand or company does. But it has a laddering of benefits that are required to deliver it. The first, and I want to use Pampers as an example here, which is actually what Jim earned, if you like, his fame within Procter & Gamble and why he got the CMO role. Pampers was always number one because its functional dryness benefits were, you know, top of the market. Nobody could equal them. Except at some point they could. And Kimberly Clark also had the technology. And the other players like SCA also had the technology. And for the first time, Procter was seeing its share flatten. Only when they took a step back and said, well, hang on, but our purpose is about child development. Underpinned by a technology that allows the, your child to sleep longer at night because the, the, the nappy is dry, that's when they had their inflection curve of a second period of growth and where they took a real leap to their competitors. So it's a purpose, but it has a strong underpinning of functional benefit. Now this afternoon, you're gonna hear Keith talk about sketches. Who here in the room has seen the sketches film? As it should be, but not quite enough. So you'll, the other sort of half uh, will like seeing that. This has now become the most watched piece of brand communication ever. No, but, if, or maybe, ever. I think it's 240 million people in the world have seen this little film that never went out on television. It's an emotional manifestation of Dove's real beauty positioning, something that we helped create and embed into the organization almost 12 years ago and still very proud of. The fact that they're able to reinvent campaigns every time over shows how important it is to have a strong emotional benefit. However, what most people don't tell you about Dove is that about two or three years into this journey, they were all so excited about the emotional benefits of Dove, they forgot about the functional part. This is not either or, it's a compounding level of benefits that you need to uh, present. And when they forgot about the functional qualities of their products, Nivea and other competitors, including Procter & Gamble, said thank you very much and started talking about those things. And Dove actually started to recede. Now that they have them together again, you see that their growth is back. So that's the emotional benefits. But there is, for many, perhaps not all companies, the opportunity to go one level up and say, no, we bring societal benefits. Now, I don't know how many of you know this campaign by Dulux, but I imagine quite a lot because it's such a strong brand in the UK. This is Dulux Let's Color campaign, where they recognized, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The, the Tipping Point? If not, as a marketer, it's a really interesting read. You know, you, the insight is you repair the windows in a, in a, in a bad neighborhood and, um, and crime goes down because people start taking care of themselves. Social control goes up, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is a favela in Rio where exactly the same happened, except instead of repairing the windows, they colored the walls. And the local Dulux company gave them the paint. 
Now, Brazil happens to be a highly competitive market. The number one and two are always around 35%. With this, over a period of three years, they grew 6% on top. They credit their purpose work in the communities of Brazil with all of that. And they've taken it now to be their global positioning as a company, and they're doing this with over 10,000 communities in the world. For me, the difference, and I'll use an example of one of your competitors, American Express, to see what real purpose is and what isn't. If you know anything about American Express, you know that they support breast cancer, uh, at least, well, they support the fighting of breast cancer and research to eliminate breast cancer. And they do so much work there that I want to take nothing away with in terms of how important it is and useful to society. But I don't see any connection to American Express. I, I, I literally don't. It could be the chairman's favorite charity or whatever. I don't see how those work together. That, to me, is not purpose. That's CSR. But they also have a program, which they started after the last economic crisis, called Small Business Saturday, where they really make it easy for small businesses to basically do the back office finance. That's very purposeful, and that's taken off like a charm, and it has driven business share. Just to sort of you know, make that real, that purpose. Purposeful positioning is important. And why? Well, this is where Marketing 2020 data comes in. On every metric that you could think of and that you could want to own as a marketer, the marketers, the companies that worked for purposeful brands significantly overperform against the companies that say they don't have a purposeful brand. Look at each of these. Share, efficiency, loyalty, net, uh, net um, uh, what is it, um, where is it? No, yeah, it doesn't really matter. But even marketing ROI. Every metric you'd want to own is significantly higher. Purpose delivers. So I think your journey is a very, very relevant one. What you've got to think about is the American Express example. How do we make it fully integrated with everything we do as a business? But that's not enough. There is a third characteristic of winning Marketing 2020 brands, and it's what we call total experience. What you see is the marketers of the most effective, most successful and fastest growing brands are taking a step back and saying, if we've got the insight and we understand what it is that we are about, why we exist, how can we make that true in as many relevant ways as possible? And for this, I want to use Nike as an example. But first, let me offer a framework because I wouldn't be a consultant if I didn't give you at least one framework that you can ignore or perhaps apply to your own business. It's something around what it is we do on behalf of the company, creating brand value. You see, where we think it's going is that there are basically two axes for the total value. They, they add up together to the total value that you have in the mind of the consumer. The first is the depth of the relationship. This is nothing new, except we're now on steroids in terms of what's possible. This is about how much do I know about you and do I employ that use to make the product or service even more useful and specific to you, Alex? So is it just a product that everybody can buy? Is it a product with instructions that are right for my region or my profession? Or is it actually a product with information and perhaps personal advice leveraging what they know about me so that it really becomes easy for me to become loyal to that brand? All of them compound the value that the brand has. And what I already described is that there's some risks with that as well. The other axis, and that's the one that's changing most at the moment, is the number of touch points. I don't think anybody here would argue that the more places that you touch a consumer in their life, as long as it's appropriate, the more value you add to that consumer, the more sort of share of experience you have in their lives. Now, that's great, but which do we actually do? What's the theory behind the criteria for selecting? Before we go there, though, just the risks. I already mentioned it. The first is privacy. One of my colleagues went to Brazil last week, and she described how she came into her hotel room. It's a nice hotel, the Emoyano. And the general manager, as they do in nice hotels, had written a little card to personally greet her. But the interesting thing was she told me this as a scare story. She said it said something in, the, in, in terms of, we know that you're a single woman in business traveling abroad, and we want you to know that the Emiliano supports women in business. 
Apparently, it's a big initiative in, in Brazil, and they're very proud of their work. Undoubtedly, it's good work, but it freaked my colleague out. She said, somewhere in some system, they know that there's a single woman in the hotel room in Sao Paulo. Do you understand that I'm uncomfortable with that knowledge? She went on to describe something that, as a man, I was completely ignorant of, that apparently 80% of women, when they hang that card with breakfast on the door handle, they lie and say that there's two people in the room because they don't want all the people walking through the corridor to know that there's a single person in that room. Again, all I'm saying is privacy is so nice when you get it right, and it's so, so bad when you get it wrong. So, yes, it's good, but you have to do it right. And for touch points, I already sort of mentioned that. If you get that wrong, just one inconsistent manifestation of the brand, and all the other stuff falls down. So you've got to get that right. Now, let me bring this to life. Amazon. How many people here use Amazon? That's almost everybody, incredible, huh? Here's the check question. How many people here would honestly say that in 2013, they bought significantly more on Amazon than the year before? Now, as marketers, let's just look among ourselves. How incredible that a company, and it's not just here, has managed to, among cynical marketers that know all the tricks in the book, They've managed to significantly increase what they're selling to us. How have they done this? Well, it's with things like, and this is one of the CMOs that I interviewed speaking. She said, I have a one-year-old son, and I'm a CMO. I have a very busy life. I've never told Amazon I have a one-year-old son. But they know, just from all the stuff I've been buying from birth, before birth, to now. And guess what? Recently, when I'm on Amazon, they're advertising walkers, you know, child walkers. Well, it happens to be very, very relevant. She said, I can go back and go to all the different shops and do all my research, but they've clearly done it for me. It's very appropriate personalization. Not in your face, just on the right of the page, and it happens to be right time, right place, right products. Amazon has clearly changed something in the way they do marketing because they're getting this right at a speed you would not believe. That's, if you like, the personalization axis. But they're not really broad in their relationship with you or me. It's you know, on my cell phone, it's at my computer, and it's when the box arrives, the moment of truth. But that about describes the relationship I have with Amazon. In contrast, take Disney. I don't think anybody as a marketer would argue that Disney is the master of brand consistency across categories. It doesn't matter whether you pick up a magazine, or you watch a video, or you, you go to their shop, or even Take a cruise, yeah, in America they pay to take, there's a Disney island, did you know that? One of our partners at the ANA took a Disney cruise, spent $13,000 on a Disney cruise with his family. The week after, he had to get a quick gift for a family member, jumped into the Disney store at Times Square, and was treated like everyone else that walks into that shop. Contrast that to Nescafe, or Nespresso rather, that you walk into their shop and they know everything about your drinking profile. So here he is, clearly a huge spender and Disney believer, being treated like everybody else. Nothing on the personalization axis. And I think as marketers, our challenge, and of course we wouldn't be consultants if the Valhalla wasn't in the top left-hand corner or right-hand for, uh, for you, and that's Nike. I said I wanted to use them as an example. Just to step back, and this is the Nike story, it's never been case studied with all the data, they're so secretive, but by now we've worked with many of their partners and we know the data. Nike was a success organization, grew every year. And 2006 was an absolute crisis year, because guess what? For the first time ever in the company's existence, they lost market share. They, they didn't even have the words in their company to describe it, because that was not what they did. They lost market share. Why? Because the functional excellence of their shoes had been equaled by their main competitors. And now there was all these speciality brands that actually are better in some of its uh, functionality. And then when you look at the emotional benefit, well, I these days can't tell the difference between an Adidas and a Nike commercial. They all have big celebrities. Well, it took them a little time to catch on, but all the competitors do the same. And suddenly everything was the same again and they started losing share. And to their credit, they went back to their insights, they went back to their purpose, which happens to be unleashing the athlete in everybody. And they said, 
can we do that better using technology? And they did basically a sort of consumer journey analysis and said, what does it take for someone to unleash the athlete in them? And yes, good shoes are important, but they're only a small component of the mix. You need the stimulus to get up and take that first step. You need the encouragement from your friends. I, I tried this and I did my first run. And about 30 minutes later, I was very proud of myself and I did all the connections with Facebook and everything. Within minutes, I had three messages with people saying, you call that a run? <laughs> it really works. And they looked at all these touch points, as you can, for your brands, and said, are there other ways that we appropriately can add value? And then Nike ID, that little thing that you put in your shoe, came out of that. That was what was possible, technically, at that time. And here come the results they don't talk about publicly. They pulled $50 million of advertising out of their mix. They went up by 14% market share in the running shoe category. 14% in one year. And it so blew them away in results that they said, this is where our future is. And that's when they took the decision to invest in the Nike Fuel Band, which has now really been driving the growth of the company. And uh, I want to show you a very quick video that describes the concept. This is the Nike Plus Fuel Band, made to inspire anyone to be more active. Its foundation is a universal system of measurement called fuel. Unlike calories, fuel lets you compare yourself with anyone, no matter what their body type is or what they're doing. The Fuel Band is the device you wear that tracks everything you do. One button lets you check your stats. LED lights change from red to yellow and then to green when you hit your goal. Motivation is the core of the experience. To make sure fuel is something people want to use and share every day, competition and celebration are built in. As we experimented with the algorithm behind fuel and the design of the experience, our work gave us an insight we felt summed up the fuel band story. Everything you do counts. Can you count, suckers? At launch, this became the campaign that introduced fuel to the world. From the moment they put it on in the morning, users are constantly interacting with the fuel band and the service that drives it. They are sharing more, talking about the brand more, and spending more on Nike products. Fuel has fundamentally changed Nike's business as well. From a marketer of athletic shoes to a company whose products and services work together in a system of value for consumers, and whose mission has become an obsession with using technology to make every athlete better. This is the Nike Plus Fuel Band. Now look, not everybody is able to create a new ecosystem, but I do think every marketer can take a step back and say, given what we know about our consumers' needs, and if you don't, you better get to know them, given what our purpose is, now what can be the total experience that manifests that? It pays back. So that's the characteristics of the winning brands. Now I want to, with a little bit more speed, go into what do we see the organizations doing to make that happen in terms of going to market. And I want to start with a point called connect, then talk about inspiration, focus, how we're organized, and how we build capability. So first, connect. If you buy into the concept that these new propositions of how we add value entail many more contacts with consumers, it also means many more people in the organization that will be leading those contacts. That means, and it's a humbling thought, but I think at the same time a very empowering thought, that marketing is just too bloody important to be left to marketing and the marketers. We have to engage with the rest of the organization, and it starts at the top. And this is where I want to speak to you as leaders that interact with other disciplines. The first question, and it sort of confirms what I was saying at the beginning, is that marketing is being listened to more. This is a, a data point versus uh, six years ago. You see that marketing being part of driving the business strategy has increased tremendously from 38% to 58% in terms of CEOs listening and considering their CMO to be a partner. And that's actually what it gets down to. You've got to see as an organization that the CEO and the CEO or a CMO, that they are basically two hands on one pie, that they work together. When you look at Unilever and Paul Pullman and Keith Wheat, they speak the same messages. Outside the company, inside the mess company, it's one. 
When you look at General Electric, same thing. And again, everywhere, it feels like they are one and leading. And what does that take? Well, we looked at the CMOs because it's not true in every industry. Take yours, for example. In CPG, yes, they listen to the CMO, 65%. But in financial, 49%. David, you still have your work cut out. But go even further down, healthcare, energy, markets which are finally privatizing and where people really do have a choice, but they're not yet listening to the CMO. So it's getting better. It's already quite high in some industries. And in some others, you still have a way to go. Now, how do you do that? By talking their language. By speaking business metrics, not marketing googly gook. Your colleagues from other disciplines have to be convinced that you are in the same business as they are. Now, let's say you've got them connected. How do you inspire them? And a key theme that came out, and I think it's so relevant for where you are, you've defined your purpose. Now it's about engagement. What we see is that the companies that really make engagement a big part of their role, the people, you, that make engagement a big part of their responsibilities, they win. Look at this. I'm proud of my brand purpose. We already knew that purpose was important. But look at the second and the third. In our company, we ensure that all employees get the purpose. Huge differentiator. No, we go beyond that. Our customers and our consumers get our purpose. We engage with them around that purpose. It's not that plaque on your table. It's what you do and what you speak about as you engage with everyone. And I know this is the one where every marketer says, well, that's our job, isn't it? We have to inspire. We're the ambassadors of the brand. But if I come and sit with you or with you and I look in your calendar and see how much time are you actually spending doing it, I know that the painful truth is that this is one of those things we all nod yes to, but we don't make enough time to, and we delegate to junior members of our staff. This is where you make a difference. The interesting thing is we know that when we advertise. Who would ever? Advertise something once. But what we do with our strategy decks is we send them around. Our purpose things, we, you know, we invite people to one conference. And then we say, who was here last year? And it's half the people. Engage, 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 communicate. One very, very hard data point uh, that I'll get to, I'll, I'll let Keith talk about um, our Unilever, is actually whether people understand the strategy. And that takes engagement. Are they focused on the few things that you think are important? And I want to show you a really scary chart, at least I think. So on the top left are the people that work in global at the highest level, EVPs and more senior. And the question is, I support the strategy. Now, the scary part is that it doesn't say 100%. I mean, that's a little bit scary when you're right at HQ and not everybody supports the strategy. But let's assume that it's high, 83%. As you see, when you go down the hierarchy, and particularly as you get away from HQ, support for the strategy drops dramatically. Now, do you really believe that that junior marketer in a local operation somewhere doesn't support the strategy? Or don't they understand it? My guess is the latter. So it's communicate, communicate, communicate. We do it externally, we know how it works, and then somehow internally, we don't apply the same rules and it makes a difference in growth, as you saw. So what about those roles? What is actually the role of marketing in a company that is not naturally marketing-led? Well, take an example from the founder of Alibaba, Asia's most successful startup. They, uh, they, they, they've, uh, they've privatized, the guy's a billionaire. We actually talked to quite a lot of founder entrepreneurs in the Asian markets that are now reaching a point where they want to retire and enjoy their money, and they suddenly face a very worrying fact because the person that takes their role is often the CEO or the CFO and becomes the CEO, and they get the numbers, they get how to talk to the street. They don't get the purpose. For founders, these things go hand in hand. If you worked at Apple and you made something that was not Applish, boom, he probably smacked you in the days that that was still legal. <laughs> it's true. But when they leave, and everybody's watching Apple now, the question is, who picks that part up? And we're not arguing that it has to be marketing that leads everything. We are arguing, as some of your competitors have done, that you need to appoint, whether it's in title or in scope, a chief experience offer that looks at everything you do and gets permission from all the other disciplines to say, 
Can I step outside the company and look at us and say, how consistent is the experience of working with Barclays? That's your role, to convince everyone that that's important, that the company needs to be organized around that. And we see that the companies where the collaboration between marketing and the other disciplines is higher, they outperform their competitors. It correlates directly. Go and talk to them. There's wonderful examples of other disciplines coming to you with innovative ideas once they understand the purpose. Because then they can apply it with their expertise and say, oh, well, if that's what we want to be, we could also do it like this. It's wonderfully empowering as marketers. We don't have to tell everyone. We do have to explain and inspire. That's why at Motorola, the CMO took the technology job under his realm. Or at Visa, Antonio Lucio said, you know what, the culture in Visa is so far off what we started the company around, which was enabling everyone to buy everything. I want to own the culture for a few years. It's got to be ship-shaped. It's not aligned with our purpose. And he did. He led HR for a few years. That collaboration is working. And it's not about new races and you know, the new playbook. It's much more about the mindset of saying, for this experience, what capabilities do we need in the room? How do we make it happen? And we move on. Because there are now so many expertises you need for different initiatives, what does it take? There are definitely new roles. I mean, you've got the data jocks. You need those. They need to feel their marketers and that their insights it's moving from the batch-wise thinking of doing insights in the past to the continuous sort of engine of insights that you then try and apply to people that feel for the communities. I mean, Unilever, they don't call it that. But for Axe, they basically have an innovation center that's expertise around horny teenagers. They are tasked to understand everything about horny teenagers. And it doesn't matter whether they're from Shanghai or Italy or New York, because they happen to be thinking about the same thing. And her name is, no, this is what expertise is about. It runs across cultures, but there are real need states that you can focus businesses around. And then in content, you've got so much in terms of creation, where the company owns a lot of content that they can use on the basis. But we can't do it alone. What we see is that the overperformance work with more agencies, because there is so much expertise out there that you need, and it's just unbelievable, and in fact, under-delivering, if one agency says, we can do that all. So more agencies. And finally, and I'll leave it there, it's about the basics. It's about your capability. It's about the capability of the people that work for you. Because what we found was that the biggest driver for competitive advantage was actually marketing capability. Are you good at it? Look at this. Overperformance on very basic things like positioning and strategy dramatically score higher versus underperforming organizations. It's the fundamentals that matter. But it isn't about new fads like digital marketing. It's actually about integrated marketing in a digital age. If you have a digital team, how do you bring that back? Because it has to be integrated across everything. And how do you do that? Well, Diageo took the whole board and the next thousand people in the organization and made them work at Facebook to think through the implications. And AB InBev, the biggest beer company, experimented and led by example at the board level by going to Foursquare and trying new things. This is the age of pioneering, of trying and leading by example. And that's where I want to leave it. Because if you bring these things together, and this is as a suggestion for topics for the discussion in a minute and for you at your round tables, it's about the characteristics of the winning brands, and then it's about the organization and making sure that every discipline understands it, is inspired by it, feels connected, understands what their role is, and is learning on the fly. When you get the what and the how both right, that's probably when you're equipped for success as you move towards marketing 2020. Now, a lot of stuff to share. I'm shortchanging the study and the initiative. David's been a, an important contributor. But for now, thank you for your, uh, for your time. And if